Hey everyone, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We are at episode 680. This is being recorded on June 8, 2022. I'm Sebastian Peak. I'm Josh Walrath. Hi. I'm Brett Van Spronberg. And I'm Kent Burgess. You can find out when we go live for events like this podcast recording session by going to pcpro.com slash subscribe if that is in fact working. And you can support the site and podcast distribution by going to patreon.com slash pcper and become a patron of the PC Per Arts. Let's move on to our most important segment of the week. It's Food with Josh. Me. Food. So, uh, yeah, I, I came home for lunch and I did my usual thing, which I'm not really going into detail here about what that is. But part of it involves dialing Born in a Barn and asking what the burger special is. But today, I said, I'd like to make an order for delivery. No, not delivery. Pick up. And, and the waitress is like, we're not doing those today due to low inventory. So apparently, there's a burger shortage. And I'm not pleased about that. First, it was computer chips. Now it's burgers. I mean, seriously. So, I had to think of my feet. I had to pivot. I had to, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, all these analytical terms that people do when they're talking about, you know, company's performance. I mean, pivot is about as close as I can get. But went down the street to Mr. Bill's Burgers. And uh, at first, I thought that this was a pulled, pulled pork burger. But it was not. It was just pure pulled pork covered in cheddar cheese then covered with coleslaw and they had a really really tangy nice barbecue sauce in there as well not not like you know craft it, it, it tasted something you know like homemade and it was a really heavy heavy pulled pork sandwich there were no burger patties disappointed in that i thought there was but obviously i misread or Either that or they put it together wrong. But I don't care, but it was still good. And the fries were were outstanding. And so through disaster came redemption or something. But I was quite happy with the uh with the results. And uh yeah, Mr. Bill's burger is Larry Wyoming. It's 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 a close second to Born in the Barn in the quality of the food that they serve. So, excellent sandwich. Let's move to our first story this week in the news. And of course, it has to be Apple because our listeners demand Apple news. They say, talk about that fruity company out in California, please. They don't really. Apple, during their WWDC 22 developer event, which they use to do hardware unveils, (laughs) they announced the M2 SoC, basically making the most of the situation, which is that they're stuck on five nanometer, but they're they're saying it's second generation five nanometer technology. So I'm guessing that means it can probably handle more power. And look at it, it's bigger. M1 versus M2, their own image here, if this is to scale, it shows that they actually did have to raise the size a little bit to accommodate the extra cores that they have put into this thing, specifically the GPU. I don't remember if the CPU has hmm. any more cores. That's no, kind of a uh, radically eight. different uh, four plan. For yeah. the M2 versus M1. Some things have been moved around for sure. Yeah. I think there's more L2 cache now for the CPU cores. And the GPU is now up to 10 cores. It was a max of 8. But mm-hmm. uh, these are only available right now on the smaller laptops. The newly redesigned MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro 13 has an M.2 version, which are shipping next month. It sounds like it's going to be faster. Obviously, you would expect that. It's just not going to be like earth shattering. It's nothing like the M1 Max or Ultra or whatever that one was called. It's not right. They're quoting, I think, 100 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Yeah, up from 668 to uh, 100. Previous one was about just under 70. But of course, the, the fastest one of their cobbled together chips has like a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. So... Oh, yeah, that may be so. That wouldn't have been like their max for the Ultra. Slower. So don't get it for the graphics. Not that you can play games on this <laughs> stuff anyway. But Wait, I'm just, you can play games on the Mac? I said not that you can. You they can actually showed Diablo some games. No, Diablo they Mortal? showed a couple no. of games in there. Not, they didn't. 
they, they, I think the performance was a little bit lackluster when they were trying to show them off, but they did show games. They were showing uh, System Shock and Quake. I don't think that's true, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> What was they're the one? Marathon? Digital. Yeah, they were showing yeah. off Marathon, and it was just buttery smooth. <laughs> and this is why we talk about Apple. I don't know how many of you watch Der Bauer's YouTube channel. He has an English channel, has for the last few months. So He's got a cat. He does. It's in almost every video. So a couple weeks ago, he had a video on the very thick IHS with less contact area that we're going to be getting with Ryzen 7000. And he was taking stills from that one installation video that was uh, released early and taking kind of like virtual measurements based on the socket size and what we know about the processor to let us Take know. out the plastic. Take out the plastic. It, it pops out, sort of. Sort of. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah, anyway, uh, he basically ended up with some interesting numbers here. Let's go. I'm going to find the part where he had it up on the screen. Became his thumbnail for the video. Here we go. So he's talking about the die size, the thermal interface material, wondering whether just the the chiplets themselves or the chiplets and the I.O. die were going to have the liquid metal, if it was going to be a combination of liquid metal and uh, regular thermal interface material, and then was measuring the sizes of everything. Again, just based on their render and assuming everything is correct here and how the, the sizes have changed. Let me try to skip ahead where he's showing the differences here. So slight, there we go. Slight differences in size, but the big deal was the uh, the heat spreader thickness and the reduced amount of contact area for your cooler up top. And obviously one of the big um, features of the new socket was that it was going to be compatible with existing coolers. But if you have a hotter chip with less surface area, it could pose a, an issue with some of the existing coolers, depending on the performance level. So that's something to to think about. But you know, I've, I've okay. Just to interject yeah, here, yeah, and I apologize. No, don't. Just do when it. I was talking to other people around the industry who actually are into chip design and we were talking about you know why, why don't you just make this massive heat spreader and pretty much all of them say it doesn't matter that much i mean sure you're gonna have you know a larger chunk of metal on top it's it's got a, a larger i guess reservoir for heat that you could that you could have but Spreading it out is not as big of a deal because, I mean, when the heat comes into the heat spreader and you've got something on top of that, the thickness of that heat spreader is the more important aspect than, you know, having thick and, and wider or having thin and wider. I mean, it's, 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 think of the heat just wanting to find kind of the straight path and sure i mean you've if you have a more conductive heat spreader it's it is going to obviously spread the heat but if you've got good contact in between a thin heat spreader and the base plate of your cooling it's not as big of a deal to have more of the ihs the the integrated heat spreader uh, does that make sense i i know if you start thinking about the physics of it it's iffy in there but it's it's not that big of a deal because really what is holding you back is is going to be the density of the chip and the surface area and so these are very very dense chips obviously and yeah the heat spreader is is going to have a very minimal effect so i i would disagree with Debauer. i could probably be wrong AC's got a lot of experience in this stuff. I mean, he, he again, designs is, uh, coolers, so what does he know? He's a professional. What does he talking. know? But no, I mean, it's it's just, you know, if, if you've got a thinner IHS and a good contact surface, if you've got a smaller IHS, it's, it's surface area-wise, it's not as big of a deal, I think. And, you know, I, I could very easily be proven wrong. Uh, about this, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's 
it's working. They're they're boosting these things up to 5.5 gigahertz and above. I, I think that this is a bit more of making a mountain out of a molehill. Now, continue on with what Debauer said. No, because no, this isn't about Debauer. I'm, it's just interesting that Debauer had that video where he was speculating based on Im, uh, stills from a video. And then a anonymous source, and this was reported first by Tech Power, but I saw it on videocards.com, but anonymous... Uh, source has posted this or allegedly they have already deleted one, an engineering sample, I assume. So if this is true, this is the IHS, which is indeed very thick. And I, what Gerbauer was saying was that the thickness was simply to match the Z height of the AM4 chips. Oh, that, they would, wanted that would to make advertise more sense. that compatibility. And you'd have to have new mounting hardware, obviously, if you made the, the thing thinner. So I would just wonder what the impact of a thick, thick IHS like, like this is going to be because the whole thing, if it transmits heat, well, I guess it's not as much of an issue because then it's just kind of evenly dissipating the heat from the IO die slash GPU and the, the two chiplets, so I don't know. But mm. it's, it's fascinating that it's already happened. Like some overclocker apparently. I don't know at, w- at what stage any Zen 4 CPUs are actually out there. Is uh, For that picture, does it look like not only is it kind of thermal around there, the thermal, regular kind of thermal material, but also um, the liquid metal, metal solder where they kind of melted it. It looks that way, yeah. I wonder if that's how they got it off, like superheating. Yeah, because it looks like that's that solder that they chipped off, and that just is almost a, a flux that is that is spread around there. Hmm. There was some commentary about how close to the edge those the chiplets are. are. Flux is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then the the other question is, of course, those so-called speed slots where just due to the way it's manufactured, you don't have glue all the way around every edge. So that's going to be held a D-lid though still. Oh, yeah. And probably destroyed the chip in the process, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Videocards.com, Less. such a bastion of of great information and another story that uh, it originates from there well not really it comes from a source or two in china i guess some content creators they already have their hands on intel a730m powered laptops that's the high end secret sources Mm -hmm. yeah so we have an it home laptop review and then Golden Pig Upgrade, a YouTube channel. And apparently there's a disparity between which driver revision was used for some of their testing, because, of course, Intel has a new driver. But the story over the last couple days has been that while the A730M performs quite well in synthetic benchmarks, in the gaming tests, it is way lower. So I don't know what that says. Like, they've optimized the driver for the gaming benchmarks, and they haven't quite dialed in some of the titles that people are testing, because they're testing some older titles here, obviously, if they're using like the... Well, Metro Exodus is not old. Hitman 2. Uh, what other tests? Well, you, you've I heard if they can go a... into developer mode of uh, 3D Mark and, uh, you know, look around and see if they're doing a lot of the funny things that NVIDIA did back in the day with the FX series. There's there's so much driver optimization that goes that, on, don't you? I do, but there's, there's so much driver optimization that goes on. And oftentimes on a per game basis, you see it all the time with, Oh, it's total, games it's total being shader, improved. um, shader mm-hmm. replacement. That's why it's stinking. They're approaching one gig in size of, of driver. Yeah. Exactly. Because there's so much game specific optimization in the driver code now. And Intel's got a long way to go before they can begin to capitalize on the years and years of driver optimization that has taken place for both NVIDIA and AMD drivers. Which is why Intel's drivers are only 78K in size. <laughs> are they literally 78K? No, they not. <laughs> well, I th- <laughs> but I'm sure there's a disparity there. And you are right that they're almost, what, they're almost a terror? I don't know how big they are. A gigabyte, would you say? Up to a gig? They're 700 anyway, megs last I saw. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Here's a I'm time sure that Intel is much smaller. Graphic score 10,532. That's a let's see. That's okay. Time spy extreme around 5,000. These are not spectacular numbers, but 
they're better than the the game benchmarks was the the chatter that it's it's not beating a 3060 mobile whoa you know, that's not you know it's it's like <laughs> oh, what is happening it's like here? brett and uh and uh, josh said there's no point in testing these things until you've got a final driver it, it's pointless then why are they selling the laptops in china without a finalized driver is what i want to know are they to play games or to play microsoft word what what minesweeper minesweeper runs okay. so smooth I think we They're, can say beyond are they the selling them or is that a, a review sample that someone's gotten a hold of? I'm not sure. I, I would assume that uh, the ithome.com review is actually. Let's see if I can go to that review and then translate it. So here's the it home review. Let's see if they uh, who sent them the review sample. I'm sure I they can't don't read. have to disclose where they got it from. Because they don't have the same rules that we do. It's a nice little I don't know. Laptop. It looks like kind of a finalized laptop. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to learn anything from this. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I guess the, end, <laughs> the, the moral of the story is wait for uh, finished drivers. Although the latest driver apparently doesn't fix the disparity between the synthetic and the actual in-game benchmark performance. How about Swedish drivers? Would, do, do, would you rather wait for... The- Swedish drivers than the Finns? Oh, you, no, you're thinking of Swedish meatballs. It's a different thing. Speaking of Intel and Odysseys, Samsung, Samsung's been on an Odyssey since CES to release the Neo G8, and now they have. You can actually go to Samsung and buy it directly from their store for $1,500. And why would you do that? Well, because the Odyssey Neo G8, and it's important to remember that Neo part because they already had some monitors with similar names. These are premium 32 inch 4K high refresh curved displays with ambient backlighting and other features like micro LED QLED backlighting and all sorts of fancy stuff. The Neo G8 is the first, or let me quote them, the world's first 240 Hertz 4K gaming monitor. I didn't know that nobody had done this yet, but apparently not. So how, how many lighting zones does it have for $1,500? I didn't see anything about full array local dimming. I only saw that mm. it had micro LED, which I don't know why you do micro LED if you weren't going to implement FALD. Let me just go to their press release to see if they have any more information about it. He's going to look. He's going to mm. look at it so hard. <laughs> oh, it says curved VA, so good blacks. It, it utilizes quantum mini LED technology, enabling ultra fine and precise control of the densely packed LEDs. Oh, so it does. So it does have full array local dimming, ensuring gamers see both dark and bright scenes as they were intended. It has HDR 2000 certification, both that and the Neo G7. Actually, the real difference Two. between the Neo G8 and the Neo G7 is just the um, refresh rate. Sorry, two thousand yeah, were... nit peak brightness. That's eye searing. Little bright, yeah. Little bright, yeah. I'm sure that's like one tiny spot, and it's just for a moment. But look at this. The the and back, then the moment's gone. Yes, the back of it uh, has a like a little mood light generator to put ambient light on the wall behind the monitor. They thought of everything. It has a one thousand R VA panel. Both of them do. With that fancy quantum mini LED backlighting technology in HDR 2000. And if you don't need 240 hertz refresh and you're okay with 165, the same 32-inch 4K experience will cost you about $1,299. And if you need <coughs> that 240, $1,500. Unrivaled. What, what, are you, what, what are you driving... This with to to even get into two hundred hertz four K. Well, you're you're playing, you're playing Fortnite or League of Legends. <clears throat> Not at four K. So, no, no, competitive gamers are are actually playing at high refresh, low res. That's well, I think. But, yeah, but still Fortnite low detail. And, what, wait, that, yes, that, you're, you're getting four hundred frames with four K and League of Legends and some of the other. MOBAs, I guess they called. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. 
According to Ars Technica, Microsoft will be requiring SSDs for new PCs soon. As if new PCs didn't already come with SSDs. And most all, do. There's all laptops that you're going to find yeah. have SSDs. So apparently, this is really only affecting a couple of segments of the marketplace, like real, real, real cheap, bottom of the barrel, supposedly kind of uh, consumer and certain business um, business machines. Really, but I think it's about time. You know, I think Microsoft has spent a lot of time actually optimizing some of their OSs for booting from SSDs. So, can you imagine? the pain people must be suffering still having spinning drives of, you know, terabyte spinning disks. It's terrible. I will say if you've run your OS off of a floppy disk long enough, hard drives seem really fast, but there's, do. there's a truth to that. Once you move to an SSD, hard drives just become cold storage. So, but I yeah. tell you though, if you ran windows 95 on an install that was two years old, That was some good living. You would start your computer up and come back five minutes later, and you're hoping it booted up. That that crunching <clears throat> sound that just kept going and going. Yeah. Even better if the bearing on your hard drive started to go, like the Quantum Fireball 6 gigabyte hard drive in the family computer in 1999. Oh, my gosh. I remember those Quantum Fireballs. It got so loud. It was... And then... Yeah. Oh, you I remember it those those micro seeks that used to make all that all that chattering. Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, and the really five and a quarter inch chatter. Bigfoot drives, yeah, those were those were those were interesting. So anyway, ARM introduced a new image signal processor. It's called the Molly C55. Now they've been doing a, a couple of versions before this, and ISPs are becoming damn near ubiquitous. Um Previously, other manufacturers had to custom design their own ISPs depending on their application. And ARM has seen this as an area where they could innovate and be able to provide really solid products uh, for people to license rather than try to develop their own. So when we're talking about inexpensive security cameras that have a dedicated ISP, instead of spending a couple of years and many, many millions of man hours designing your own, you you simply license it from ARM. And uh, this is a couple of generations now. It's one of their newest ones. Uh, it, it, it has multiple 4K input signals, like up to eight. Um, can do all kinds of fun stuff. Half the size of the previous lower power, all of these positive, positive things. And yeah, I mean, we're talking about maybe it won't be in used in cars, but there are tremendous applications out there, uh, inexpensive stuff that could really use some good ISPs back there. And yeah, they're, they're, they're addressing an area that they felt uh, is underserved and certainly if we look in the past, uh, many companies who have required this have either gone to a third party to design it for them or have, you know, spent that money internally to develop their own ISPs. And now we've finally got ARM really on board with a solid implementation with the C55. And we'll learn about it more in, in the next few weeks about how good or possibly bad it is, but I, I don't think it's bad i think it's it's probably going to be utilized in a lot of iot devices that that require this kind of application everyone loves the seam hardware survey it's oh so riffing accurate. on this is it's, it's fun so it's fun riffing it's on 100 percent a reflection of what the enthusiast community is actually using in their systems so the hardware survey for may 2022 let's look at this now by the way the 1060 has been on top for eons but it's almost given way to the GTX 1650. But I want you to notice two things about that. I think uh, the hottest cards in the gaming community are both making slight gains in May, and that would be the RX 580 and the GTX 1060. How far hot, down the hot, list hot. are those? Because I'm not seeing them. On hot, the gainers, right hot gainers, hot uh, gainers. If you just scroll a little bit, there you More go. Hey, people. look at that. There's Look at that, puppy. The G <laughs> RX 580, baby. Wow. RX 580. More people. And, uh-huh. More people gaming on an RTX 3080 than an RX 580. Yeah, but I mean, who has a 3080? 
Just think you know what? If, if you're running <laughs> Steam, RX 580. if you're running Steam, Steam and you got an RX 580 and it asks you to do that, you're so embarrassed. You're like, no, I'm not going to give you the information on my machine. So obviously, RX 580 is underrepresented in this uh, in this survey. I I think you're right, Josh. But the important thing is both the RX 580 and the 1060 making gains in May 2022. The other fun thing I happen to notice here is that there's more XE graphics, and XE is very very closely tied to the 750 Ti. Uh, and we know you know what a gaming um, you know stalwart that's been. Um, but more more XE graphics than the RX 5700 XT the 2080 Ti, the 3080 Ti, the 3090, and even the 1070 Ti. It's kind of a funny thing to think about. Where's the 3060 Ti? Uh, up higher, I think. Yeah. Up here. There 1. it is. 0.7% yeah. of gamers on it. I was I surprised to see the... Buys. The 3070 to be that high, actually. I was surprised by that. For a while, the 3070 was cheaper than the 3060 Ti. Well, which just wasn't available at all. So I guess that's why. Right. right. So I I thought the reprint of the 2060 would have pushed it up the charts a little bit, but not really seeing it. Doesn't really clock in as high as I thought it would. 2060 is in fourth place. I thought it would be higher than that. 2060. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I would expect fully. The 1060 has such a big lead, and people who had it haven't been able to upgrade, so they're stuck with it. And then you mm-hmm. had the cheapest cards next, the 1650 and the 1060. Yeah, I guess. But uh, just the the fact that the first Radeon card doesn't appear until, like, I don't know how many this is, like 12. 18th or something. Okay. Yeah, something like that. And then the next AMD card is just called AD, AMD Radeon Graphics. Whatever that like, means. Is it, not specific probably the, at all. It's probably yeah. the APU. They haven't upgraded the drivers from what came with <laughs> it's Windows. It's running 10. the Windows drivers. Oh, that's yeah. Probably it's just, it. Uh, yeah, it's AMD Radeon. But look at that. 91.66% uh, of cards now are DirectX 12 compliant. All right. So uh, what's next here? Something about well, Prime Gaming. All right. Hold on. Let me yeah. transition. Oftentimes we do a, like, here's a bundle of games to go off and take a look at and, you know, to buy and whatever. But I happened to catch this email that came out a little while ago, and I was surprised to see a few games that, oh, gosh, I usually I, I free games with your Prime subscription. And I didn't think much of it, and actually I saw it, and I, I was surprised to find there's a few games in there that I'd be happy to play, like uh, World Rally 8 and uh, Escape from Monkey Island. And even Far Cry 4. So free games with your Prime subscription. Now, what it does is it links your Prime subscription with whoever the vendor of the game is. So typically for Far Cry 4, it'd be like Ubisoft. So, you know, you'd have to kind of link the two of them together. But it's yours to play. Free. And I didn't even know this existed. Time being, it says it ends in 22 days. Do you have to claim it within 22 or you only get to play you, it for 22? It's claim. You have claim. to claim it within the 22 days and then you can continue to play. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so I thought that was an interesting. And they deal. change and I every month. Yeah, they I didn't know this existed. Every month. Yeah, I had no idea. I knew Epic gives away stuff all the time, but I had no idea that. Uh... Look, another another reason that Amazon has an impact on your life. Just check the box and just say yes. Does Amazon have an Free impact stuff. on your life? A positive. A it's positive. Bread and circuses, man. Amazon giving us <laughs> the bread and circuses. <laughs> Anyway, that's cool. If you got a Prime subscription, it's free with your subscription. I didn't know they were giving away games just for having Prime. So go take advantage of that. Welcome to Amazon. I love you. Welcome to Amazon. <clears throat> I love you. So that was our gaming category. According to Hackaday, the great Eurosat hack should be a warning to us all. Does us mean US? Is this a Jeremy? Uh, title? It is a Jeremy. It is a Jeremy, but this is. You know, Jeremy did make a mention of this. This is, it, it was conveniently timed for when a certain country invaded another country a little while ago. Um, and uh, I think they were attempting to knock out some of the um, communications, lines of communications. So this is from the KA SAT system that got a DDoS attack that tried to take a lot of it offline. But in the same time that that happened, they managed to grab control of a back-end administrative system at the same time and were able to infect a tremendous number of commercial segment modems out there and 
knock them completely offline with a, uh, a firmware download. So they're bricked so hard, they will never come back. It actually also took off, took out power generation con- command and control for certain um, facilities in Germany and Poland. Uh, so I found that very interesting. This is just a warning in uh, that um, our systems are heavily interlinked. You never know what's going to get um, attacked. And there are bad actors out there that are just waiting to um, take advantage of those those holes in the system. Nobody's safe. Uh, this was Viasat, by the way, that they actually ended, ended up having to send out more than 30,000 modems to a lot of commercial customers in order to essentially unbrick them. They were, they, they were dead. And a heartwarming story tonight, ExpressVPN <laughs> doing the right thing, question mark? Well, I think we've attacked them before with potentially being seemingly, you know, maybe not always doing the right thing. But in this case, it is a heartwarming story. Apparently in India, there was a new law that said that they must expose uh, ownership and names and other information about connected users to all internet connected systems and VPNs included. And ExpressVPN refused to cooperate and pulled out their ser- pulled their servers out of India so that they wouldn't have to cooperate. So security for, them. for the little people. Kent, wake up. Uh, I'm here. Blow your nose. Take a drink of water. The th- well, that's just what I've been doing. I may go get a beer while you're doing this. Mm. Drink your beer. <laughs> I'm not going to drink a beer. I'm going to get a beer. Then I'm going to drink yes. a beer. That's the correct order. Yes, do that. We are moving directly to the reviews reviews portion of our podcast and kent has another case reviews another week another case review and look at the lighting look at the photography it's it's almost makes me tear up kent this is so nice i took that shot about 20 times <laughs> i believe you and it worked it worked out beautifully go Finally, to the website yeah. and and look at the review just for the pictures, if nothing else. Oddly enough, that was the first shot I took, and then I shot it like 20 more times, and the first one was the best. But anyway. <laughs> what is this case? This is the brand new, uh, just dropped today, Fantex Eclipse G360A. Um, it's very similar uh, in construction to some of their previous P series cases, but this is the first G series case they've released. Um, it's essentially, like I say, one of their uh, P series cases, but bigger. Um, it's got really good radiator support, uh, it's space for a lot of fans, a lot of hardware. Uh, up to a 400 millimeter long graphics card, hmm. if you can find one. <laughs> one of that and, size uh, or a graphics card at all? A, a, a graphics card that's 400 millimeters long. Yeah, that's that uh, be... 15.7 inches for us here in the United <laughs> States who reject the metric system. Freedom units. Cooler height's a little low, though. 162? 162, yes. I think, are you, are you going to be able to get your Hyper 212 Evo in there? Isn't that 164, 165 millimeters? I think they're 163, but oh, I could... Oh, awfully close. I don't think it would fit in a no. D15, though, depending on how high that middle fan is. Interesting. Super long PSU and GPU support. CPU cooler mm-hmm. height's a little light, but they... They have a lot of cable management space. That's where those extra millimeters went. 1.4 it, inches of cable management space behind the motherboard tray. Well, not entirely so. <laughs> uh, it's 1.4 inches toward the front side of the case um, where the fans are. It's probably only about three quarters to a half inch behind the motherboard tray itself. Okay. Um and that's sort of one of the things uh, it, it, Sebastian actually asked me uh, today to explain why I, I only gave this a silver award and after, you know, the testing of it went so well and it, you it raved mainly about comes how beautiful to, it is and how it, they got it the is white, a very right? beautiful white case. is not easy to do. And they got the feet to match the metal and it, the plastic parts and 
Yes, they sh- like, they did. Yeah, silver. The, the the reason it's silver is because of the quality of the construction. It's not poorly built. It's just built cheaper. Um, there's some shortcuts taken. Uh, the plate above the power supply and the motherboard tray is one stamped sheet uh, bent. Um, and the rear panel is also one stamp sh- sheet. Uh, not the rear panel, but the uh, rear PCI Express bracket okay. and IO is all one piece, and it it just sort of gives it a cheaper feel. Uh, if you pick the case up, it's really lightweight. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just a. It just it, there's a little bit of flex in the chassis. Um, I tried. I, I've just test fitted three different graphics cards, and two of them I had some problems getting the uh, the PCI Express screws to to line up on the the back, and had to flex the case a bit to get the the screws oh, in to hold yeah, the graphics card. Yeah, because it was card. kind of bending the yes the back in. Yeah, that happens with really inexpensive cases. So that's kind of a this is a hundred dollars, right? right? And this is a hundred dollar case, yeah. but it offers a ton of support and performance that you generally don't normally find in a one hundred dollar case. Now, did you find it um, to be accurate that this can actually hold these all these configurations of fans? Like you said, something about it being a little tight. Was it up top for a three hundred and sixty? Oh well, that's only if you were um, actually yes. All of the configurations that Fantex claims are one hundred percent legitimate. Okay, where it would be tight is if you wanted and and Fantex says this won't work, but I actually got it to work. Um, if you have a 360 radiator in the front and you put it on the outside just behind the mesh, put the radiator out there, put the fans inside, you could still get not all 360 radiators, but you could actually still fit a second 360 in the top. It would need to be one of the smaller, um, something like the uh, the Corsair radiators, which are made by uh, Hardware Labs, or one of the Hardware Labs L-series, which they're only 120 millimeters wide um, and 30 millimeters thick. So you could fit one of those in at the top and still have another in the front, as long as you put the one in front where the fans are sitting in that photo on the outside of the actual chassis, just behind the uh, the mesh. Hmm. Like I say, so it, it would take some doing. You would have to make your measurements carefully before you order the radiator, but it can be done, uh, even though Fantex says it can't. Um, some of the... There's no grommets for the power supply cable pass throughs or any of the pass throughs. Oh, really? Um, but they're yeah they're they're turned at an angle so that you really don't see them. Oh, right, right. Um, yes, okay. It has kind of a shield for the main right. um, cable uh, channel. Uh, some of them are a little small, and and they're small in places where they you should know how large the plug passing through would be, like the. Um, the eight pin uh, CPU power um, at the top, the the port for that cable is really tight fitting and you've got to sort of angle the, the power supply plug through to get it in so you can feed it to the motherboard. Um, and so just, just little things, you know, but performance wise, it's a great case. Can and I interrupt for a second? You were talking sure. about little things. Now, Fantex sent along a cooler and a power supply with the case for the review, right? Yes. This is an AMP 1000 power supply, which is, of course, white, and it perfectly matches the case. Yes. Nice. But look at the next picture. I thought the white balance was off until I realized, no, this is white. The cables are off-white. <clears throat> yes. Why? Mm. Yeah. And uh, there was one other thing about the power supply cables on that that – I've found on several power supplies lately, they're not, no one seems to be shipping power supplies with just eight pins. 
They're no. all eight pin plus six plus two yes. pigtails. And it looks terrible because, and GPU manufacturers say, no, don't do that. It forces you so, to use cable extensions if you want your case to look less messy. If yes. You're using an individual yes. cable for the, each of the eight pins. Instead of using, you know, a split off, you know, eight to one and six to another on the same cable. Yeah. But you can see that case uh, behind me, and it is extremely white. And yes. it's a, it, when there's a system in it, it's a beautiful case. Once you've got the system built, the case performs very admirably. Um, it's just the building experience is not as great as I feel like it could be or should be for a $100 case. Um, but, you know, it, for the amount of hardware you can fit in and how it performs, it's pretty much equal to, in performance, their uh, P500A case, which is $160. Okay. So, yeah. Thermals look fine. It's a little bit higher. GPU thermals are quite a bit higher than they were in that uh, O11 Dynamic Mini. Yes, Yes. But the, the, I think the big thing there is the O11, the, the fans are in the bottom blowing right on the GPU. Yeah, yes. But hey, that's, um, you know, it's enclosure design. Uh, obviously, yes. a better idea to do that. Yeah. The, um, and the included fans in this case, um, they're, they're all three front. They don't include an exhaust fan. You could uh, reconfigure it, but... Uh, I actually got better results with it just using the three front. Uh, they spin up to 1600 RPMs and it is ridiculously loud at that speed. <laughs> um, I turned them down to 1200 RPMs. There was almost no difference in temperature and the noise difference was immense. That's almost so, always the case. The only time it isn't is back when I was doing something like the, the Fortress FTO2, where if you turn up the intake fans, because those were on the bottom blowing up, you get much better temperatures. But in a lot of these cases, the front intake, six, 800 RPM is the sweet spot. And there's, it's not just diminishing returns. It's like no improvement except for the production of significantly more noise to turn them up to 100%. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. But look at this another yes. great photo. I debated on whether this one or the other one should be the cover photo, but I put this one at the end. God, look at that light. That is look at how it's all nicely illuminated in there with the RGB and did nice with the white lights. And it's the backlighting. Is, he, this, he does backlighting really it, well, like a bias light yeah, kind of a thing. Is, but this shadows. is a great composition. hmm I, I will okay. thank you. If we're gonna critique you. the composition, I will say. As the resident <laughs> asshole here. Uh you don't leave a lot of space, uh, no headroom. That's about where the picture ended at the top there. I would have liked a little more space above it. There's a reason for that. Oh, okay. There's an obscene <laughs> poster right above that. <laughs> there are things that will come into the picture if it's any ah, further. Ah, well, then you did exceptionally yes. well. Yes. And it looks great. But look at that. All of that. I, honestly, I totally understand now. You have talked me through why a case that looks this nice, and it's a mesh front, so it's higher airflow. You don't have to crank up those front fans to get good cooling. Eh, why it would uh, only get the silver award. But, you know, when you look at that, and when you look at that photo, that does not look like a $100 case. That looks very much like their, like I said, their P500A which is 160. It looks like a more expensive case than it is. Um, and it supports a lot of hardware. So, you know, for those reasons, I think it's great. It just not just as rigidly, rigidly built as I would have liked. Yeah. Yes. Very quickly here. I'm going to look at a review that I posted on the Patriot Viper VP 4300. It's a PCIe gen four SSD, but they specifically had talked about doing this, for a PS5. Like, hey, do you want to review a PS5 SSD? And it comes with a couple different uh, options for heat spreaders. So there's there's a regular heat spreader sticker thing. There's a aluminum heat sink, 
or aluminium, depending on where you are in the world. And I chose to stick the aluminium heat sink on it. This has an InnoGrit controller. It has DRAM. It's pretty fast. The rated speeds are up to 7,400 megabytes per second reads and up to 6,800 megabytes per second writes. Which is kind of interesting because the Rainier IG5236 controller specification tops out at 6,400 megabytes per second, but I'm thinking the DRAM implementation is how they're getting the slightly faster sequential performance, which may or may not drop during extended workloads. But I didn't do any hardcore testing on this. I just wanted to put it in my PS5. So as I point out in the review, if you're one of the very few who own a PlayStation 5 and use it and didn't just resell it for easy money, you'll find that that hard drive for the, the SSD inside of it fills up very fast. So I went from, I don't know if I show it on here or not. So it starts off at, what is it? 825 gigabytes, but in reality, it's 667.2 formatted and after the OS and other space. And mine, after deleting something, I had 60 gigs free. And this is always the case. It's always full. And I have to delete one game to install another and I use it as a, it's just a glorified PS4 in my house. We have like three PS5 games, including the digital. Oh, wow. Captain it can take title. up to a 110. I didn't know that. Yeah. Isn't that odd? I opened this up and the first thing I see. Go get is, one of those, you know, big ass uh, Samsung uh, P, what, 951s or whatever that is. Or Intel. They were doing that for their highest end consumer, mm-hmm. uh, whatever that one was. Anyway. Yeah, if you open up the PS5, you'll be greeted with the mount for the M.2 drive on the 110. So just move that down to the 80. You unscrew this, you just move it over. It's so a I nice send-up to the Craftsman screwdriver also, by the I, way. I know, I threw say. that in there. Just like, you know, it was a recommendation from Project Farm. $20, mm-hmm. the nicest $20 screwdrivers I've ever used. It was the whole set. Yes. I picked yep. it a while back. Anyway, uh, I installed the Viper, the Viper VP4300 in there. And booted up the PS5, and it said, M.2 SSD storage. You need to format it. So I formatted it, because there was nothing on it. And it immediately does a little benchmark, and I was getting 6,348.503 megabytes per second. I don't know what the Q-depth was. I don't know what the file transfer size was, but that's what the PS5 said it was. And then, here it is, Viper VP4300. So I was able to go in... And as I said, please don't judge the games because this is really my son's uh, game system. But Astro's Playroom, one of the only Mm -hmm. PS5 titles that we have because it came free with console. So you just, I checked the boxes next to all the PS4 games and clicked on move. And it took, I don't know, seven minutes total. And it was done. And now I had almost 400 gigs free on the internal drive and uh, 671 free on the uh, Viper drive. And when I was playing, like play testing, I didn't do stopwatch testing or high speed cameras or anything. I just noticed that whenever I opened up a PS4 game and started playing it, it nothing had changed. Like the experience was exactly the same as it was from the internal drive. So that's my plan going forward. Use this for PS4 games. Never notice a difference at all. And have all of the internal drive available for PS5 games if and when I ever get any. So, and because of the price, which by the way has dropped since I wrote this, it's now one thirty-five. The drive, Whoa, we last week, the drive we talked about last week, only the ten P left. Forty-one is one hundred and forty-nine dollars for a one terabyte Gen Four drive with better performance. But still, this one includes two different heat spreader options, and if you're just putting it in a PS Five, it is handy to have everything you need in the box. And it's only 135 I mean, that's not a bad price for a Gen 4 with a heat sink. So it's the Viper. Do you have any windows to Vipe? <laughs> terrible old, old, old joke. Watch out, here comes the Viper. <laughs> this is why you tune in live, because this yes. gets cut. Let's move to Pixel of the Week. Viper. Sorry. Let's move <laughs> to Viper. Picks of the Week. Let's move to Picks of the Week. Josh, get us started. Okay, so I, I built up some credits on Amazon. 
And I, I, I thought, you know what? I saw a little thing on YouTube about some made soy sauce and I'd been considering, you know, some non Kiko man type soy sauces to try something different. And I saw this one about this guy making the four year fermented soy sauce. And sure enough, they have it on Amazon. It's a little pricey. 47 bucks for 18 ounces. You, but you know what? Wow. It's, you paid it's really tasty. It's not as salty, even though, you know, it, it, it's got just as much sodium as a regular, you know, Kiko man. Uh, it doesn't taste as salty. It's, it's a more interesting kind of mellow flavor. It, it's almost a little bit more earthy than, uh, than a regular soy sauce. So, you know, it's expensive. It's not something that you will purchase every day. But you know what? You can get a hold of this and it's, and it's, you know, really kind of unique. They age them for four years in these giant wooden tubs with, you know, local flora and fauna just falling on top of it and doing interesting things. And, um, you know, don't don't pay attention to the September 20th, 2017. The ones that they have now are obviously 20. Well, that would be five years old, well, four and a half years old, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you know what? Sometimes you just got to live a little. And I did. And this is really, really tasty stuff. If you're really into sushi and that, this is going to be fantastic. But, you know, I'm, I'm not into fish at all. But the other night, I even just put this on popcorn, and it was what? really good. I know. Soy sauce on popcorn. You Okay. Gourmet soy sauce. $47 a bottle soy sauce on popcorn. Yeah, it's, it, well, it doesn't take Josh much. Josh is an everyman. Josh is an everyman. That's Stop what I it. thought. I thought he was, and now I find out he's some sort of elitist <laughs> about his soy sauce. Soy sauce on popcorn. Well, I was Who drinking thought? Miller Lite and eating... Two dollar popcorn, and I decided when I, I said need to my enhance this, fifty dollar elevate this experience. Hey, it, it did song. elevate the experience. So okay. you you got every every interesting aroma and flavor out of that mm-hmm. because you know popcorn is is you know it's like lobster, just absorbs what you're soaking it in. Uh, Michael T in the chat says, "Put some on your burgers," which I absolutely agree with because. Oh. Totally. What, I mean, yep. I'm gonna do point, some on steaks. Yeah, yep. it's like Worcestershire sauce, yeah. kind of like just yeah. uh, yep. that yeah. briny. So you know, I'm excited about the uh, possibilities because it is just you know taking a you know and putting a drop on your finger and and taking a taste. It's it it is it's hard to explain, but it is really different, really interesting. And you know what? Someone handcrafted this and it waited around for you to eat for four years. So did you give it a go? Toad Sloth, did you eat the popcorn with chopsticks? No. That would be the authentic experience. Okay. uh, Brett, your pick. Now, I picked a game this this week, but I picked it in a format that many of our, our watchers, listeners might not be familiar with. This format is called a board game, oh, and you play it in an, in an unusual way. You play Can it I in stop? real Can life. I, stop? I know I, I know you're basking <laughs> in the sarcasm here. Do you know that tabletop <laughs> is very popular among like millennial hipster yeah. types? Yeah, well, not everybody. Like but. neo-nerds who go to comic book stores and just like, – which have become – Board game stores, my local comic book shop, very true. Fanfare, half the store is board games now. Anyway, excellent. Continue. Then this is probably going to be very familiar to very familiar to many people. Maybe not. My anticipation was is that eh, this isn't a format that most people are familiar with. Board games, people in real life, you actually sit down with people and play a cooperative board game up to a point. This one is called Betrayal at House on the Hill. It's a game that I've personally played many times, and it is tremendously enjoyable. And it starts out with, uh, and its replayability is very, very high. 
it starts out as a cooperative ex- exploration of a sort of uh, generated house, which is generated by these cards that come out onto the table and generate a, a map on the fly. And uh, the way that things connect and the way that you bring in the people alter the gameplay as well as things that happen during play that are random. And at a certain point, the game goes from cooperative to adversarial because one of the players becomes the adversary in a certain manner. And those scenarios are uh, Does that large. say second shitten? Uh, I don't think it says shitten, but... Um, second shitten. so. Probably. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a table. Uh, Mead has just thrown a picture of a table. Uh, that's a place where people can gather around a flat surface and play this game. And it actually lays and this out is, this on the is, table. This is B-O-R-E-D games, right? Board no. game. No, it's B-O-R-D. You can't spell. <laughs> no. B-O-A-R-D. <laughs> What the hell was I thinking? Uh, Lord. Let's see what uh, <laughs> tables have been turned. <laughs> Let's see what the users have to say you're, over your crushing game grip Geek. of logic. Anyway, Board Game Geek gives this a seven point one. It's from two thousand four. Three to six players, about a one hour playing time, ages twelve and up. Complexity rating is uh, two point three nine out of five. It's very easy to play. I definitely recommend at least three players. It plays better with four or five players. Hmm. And the expansions that add new people and new scenarios, uh, highly recommended. It's a lot of fun. Um, definitely, if you've got some people around you that that want to play games with, you can play. It's you got to have like a, I think there's minimum age on this of like twelve. I would recommend that. Um, but it's definitely you know suitable for people of quote unquote all ages. Oh uh, yes, and and you can actually buy two of those and still have some money left over. And not have spent as much as Josh's soy sauce. Yeah. Oddly enough. That was the other reason I picked it. It's a fun game and it's on sale. What was it? $21? $20.49. Round down, it's $20. Okay. But after tax, it's, you know. Normally it's about 30, but yeah. All right. Uh, I was going to say, Jeremy, your pick, but it's not Jeremy. Or is it? It, No, uh, it is not Jeremy. Left corner. Go. So I've cut a lot of flack in the past about some of my previous picks, like, you know, $700 headphones that are marked down from a thousand, things of that nature. So I went with something a little more reasonable this week. Um, This is something that every desktop computer in this house has one of these. It's a Sabrent seven port USB three hub. It's powered, comes with a 12 volt plug. So you can, it's got five USB 3 compatible ports on the back that are available for use, two on the front, and the two red ones are just for powering, just for charging. So you can plug two items in in the front and still charge two others if you need to. It's about the size of a deck of cards, if anyone remembers what those are. Um, and it's on sale for 33 bucks. And like I say, every desktop computer in this house has one of these attached because it makes things really handy. And the thing I like about it is unlike a lot of your desktop USB hubs, things are actually, there are ports facing away from you. So you don't have all this mess of cables facing you all the time. You can just have the, the four blank ports and just use those when you need them. As was pointed out in the chat, Kent, uh, card games are actually a, a, a tabletop game as well. That's why I didn't know if anyone remembered what they were. <laughs> See, I went down that road too and got killed for it. <laughs> killed for it? No, I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, if you haven't been following the sort of the nerd community in recent years, <sighs> tabletop okay. gaming has become very popular. I was trying to have your back, Brett. Thank you. Yeah, collectible card games. Heard of them? Did you live through the pandemic with us? Have you seen the value of those things skyrocket? Yes. Pokemon cards at all-time highs. Magic Uh, cards, mm. Pokemon cards. Yes. Okay. My pick is one that I've picked before, but it's worth picking again every couple years just to get the word out there. And this has gotten 
more expensive, unfortunately, as everything else has. It's a it's a deer stalker hat, right? No. It's the Vornado oh. or Vornado oh. AC three fifty. It's an air purifier. But let me tell you about why this is so great. I do not represent the company. I bought this myself two years ago for ninety nine dollars. It's now one forty nine ninety nine. So it's gotten more expensive. But what's great about this is it works really well. It is reliable. It's very quiet. If you want it to be, there's three speeds, like a lot of these. But I, my last couple of air purifiers all got really loud towards the end of their life. This thing has been going strong for two years. It just has this one uh, fan, this like turbine style. What is that? Is that what you call that? It's a blower fan. Like blower giant, fan, like a, just like on GPU blower. Radeon. Yes. Vega. It's just this oh, one yes. fan that doesn't spin 56. very fast, but it draws air in kind of an interesting way. I don't know if it shows how it draws the air in. It draws it uh, along the front edges, like inside the front edges. It draws it. So not directly from the front. So it stays, the front of it stays clean. And then all of the accumulation of stuff is on the inside of the front, which lifts right off with magnets. And the, magnets. the other great thing about this is the replacement filters and pre-filters for it are not expensive. The HEPA filter is $33.99, and a two-pack of the carbon pre-filters are 15 bucks. So a lot of these, you'll get them, and it's like the printer and ink thing. It's $100 to get the unit, and then there's $50 or $60 for the HEPA filter. First party, not third party, their own HEPA filters are $33.99. And they, I replace them about once every six months to a year. And I, the only reason I was thinking about this is I just replaced the HEPA filter and uh, pre-filter a couple days ago. And they're still the same price. It's like 32 bucks. You could do subscribe and save on them and save a couple dollars more, but it's the only thing that keeps me breathing in the house with two dogs. That's our show this mm -hmm. evening. Thank you for tuning in. And oh, you might be watching this or listening to this during the day. It might not be evening for you, but it's evening for us right now as we record this on... The 8th of June, 2022. It's 11.42 p.m. on the East Coast as I'm speaking right now. And I have so many people to thank. The panelists, of course, who made this show possible tonight. You, the viewer, the sponsors. The listener. Uh, didn't have any sponsors this week, unless I forgot. So uh, I was, I was reaching for that. Okay. Uh, mm. A plea. The plea to sponsors. Uh, please sponsor our show <laughs> so we can continue to do it. Because people appreciate it, I think. Uh, dozens of you. <clears throat> Uh, comment almost every week and we appreciate that so there seems to be a certain amount of amusement extracted from this show by several people yeah a handful which is good uh, if you know we're making you a difference to a few people's lives isn't it worth us doing this every Wednesday night for two hours <sighs> it is and then the finished product far less than two hours and if you want to watch the full thing become a patron of PC Purr and you can watch the uncut goodness whenever you want <laughs> 